Hi, my name is Victoria Thompson. I am an associate professor of history at Arizona State University, and my research specialty is in 18th and 19th century France. So I'm going to draw on that today to talk to you about statues. Now, we all know that statues of famous people can be both inspiring and controversial. This is true today, and it was true in the past. Statues are more than memorials to famous people who lived in the past. They also offer us a window into what people in the past thought about authority, about leadership, and what values they prized. So let me give you a quick overview of how approaches to creating statues has changed over time. The practice of putting up statues to celebrate real individuals rather than mythic characters or godlike characters dates back to ancient Athens. As the Greek and Roman republics gave way to the Roman Empire, it became the accepted rule that only rulers, only emperors, should be the subject of statues. The Renaissance revived this practice, and in France, statues of kings were commissioned beginning in the 16th century. However, by the 18th century, this practice was being challenged as part of the Enlightenment's questioning of tradition. During the Enlightenment, intellectuals, commonly known as philosophes, began to question the practice of celebrating kings with statues of them as conquering warriors. As you'll remember, the Enlightenment was an intellectual movement that began in the early 18th century as intellectuals applied the principles of the scientific revolution to politics and society. Thinkers such as Montesquieu and Voltaire embraced these principles of direct observation, empirical evidence, and questioning tradition to examine even the most hallowed institutions such as divine right monarchy. The revolution that began in France in 1789 transformed the political system from an absolute monarchy to a constitutional monarchy and then to a republic. During the French Revolution, statues were a way of celebrating new people and new values. After 1815, the restored Bourbon monarchy attempted to put back statues of kings that had been destroyed during the revolution. However, the challenge of depicting French monarchs in a way that would not revive the divisions of the revolution proved a very difficult stumbling block. So now that I've given you an overview, let's begin our in-depth discussion with the statue of Henry IV. Henry IV was a member of the Bourbon family, who, which was a branch of the Capetian dynasty that had been on the French throne since 987. While the Capetian kings had not always ruled the entire territory of what we think of today as France, the monarchy slowly and continually increased its control over the country. A huge step forward in creating a unified France came in 1589, when Henry IV became king at the end of the Wars of Religion. Raised as a Protestant, but a convert to Catholicism, Henry made great efforts to bring peace and prosperity to the entire country. One of the ways in which he did this was through public works projects, building a new city hall, a new bridge, and the first royal plaza in the capital. Although Henry IV was well loved by most of his subjects, he was assassinated in 1610. In 1614, Henry's wife, Marie de Medici, commissioned a statue of her late husband to be cast in bronze and put on the Pont Neuf, which was the newest bridge in Paris and a place where Parisians frequently gathered. De Medici was inspired by the Italian practice of erecting statues to leaders, which began during the Renaissance and was itself an imitation of ancient Roman custom. The statue of Henry IV was meant to echo that of the equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius in Rome. On the pedestal of the statue were four captives, men with their hands bound behind them sitting on the trophies of war. In subsequent years, other statues of French kings appeared in Paris. That of Louis XIII on horseback was commissioned in 1639, along with three statues of Louis XIV by the end of the 17th century. The most notable of these was in the Place de Victoire, where the king stood in his coronation robes, surrounded by weapons used to crush heresy, a reference to the revocation of the Edict of Nantes, which had established tolerance for Protestants. As with the statue of Henry IV, 
four male slaves were carved into each side of the pedestal upon which the statue of Louis XIV was set each of which was meant to symbolize a different European country conquered by the king. This statue was immense. It towered over the surrounding space and it was meant to be illuminated day and night, 24 hours a day by four lanterns. The words to the immortal man were carved into the pedestal and critics complained that the statue with its size and with its slogan was blasphemous and idolatrous and that it was a celebration of royal pride rather than true majesty. In 1763, the last statue of a French monarch, Louis XV, was put up in what is today the Place de la Concorde or the Square of Concord, a royal square that at the time was called the Square Louis XV. This statue was different from those that preceded it. And looking at the ways in which it's different helps us understand how enlightenment philosophy was altering the ways that educated men and women were thinking about the institution of monarchy. In this statue, Louis XIV is also on horseback but at the corners of the pedestal are statues not of conquered peoples, but rather of the virtues a king was meant to embody. Force, but also peace, prudence, and justice. These virtues were not captive male slaves, but were attractive female figures. Although as with the statue of Louis XIV commissioned in 1685, this statue celebrated the conclusion of a war the focus was not on victory, but on peace. The sculptor, a man named Edmé Bouchardon, wanted the statue to communicate, as he put it, more a pacifier than a conqueror. This shift was one that would have pleased the philosophe Voltaire. In his 1751 book called The Century of Louis XIV, Voltaire wrote that although it was the custom to depict conquered peoples or slaves on the pedestals of rulers, it would be better to place there what he called free and happy subjects. The royal sculptor who worked for Louis XV took inspiration from Voltaire's words and designed a statue for the French city of Reims in which Louis XV was depicted standing with two figures at his feet one representing the gentleness of government and the other the happiness of the people. Similarly, the statue of Louis XV in Paris was meant to represent the king as protector and father of his people. The figures around the pedestal were allegorical, however, representing royal virtues rather than happy subjects. The idea, however, that figures other than king should be the subject of statues was in the air in the 18th century. In 1732, Edward Titon du Tillet, who held an office in the royal bu bureaucracy, envisioned a, a statue that he called the French Parnassus. This statue, which was never built, was supposed to be in the form of a mountain, and it would have Louis XIV dressed as the god Apollo at the top. Beneath the king, who was supposed to appear as, quote, the father and protector of the sciences and the fine arts, were figures not of slaves or captives, but who represented actual people, giants of French literature and music, including the playwright Moliere and the composer Lully. The project was meant to glorify the monarch as a facilitator of cultural achievement, as well as poets and musicians of the 17th century. It was also meant to encourage emulation or imitation. So the likenesses of future geniuses could be added to the empty spaces that were left in the statue in the belief that this would be a powerful incentive to achieve greatness. Titon du Tillet's project was never completed, but it served as the inspiration behind a government directed effort to commission statues of great men, as they were called at the time, during the reign of Louis XVI. Other projects to great men were initiated by French subjects themselves, not by the government. In 1770, a group of writers and philosophes opened a public subscription to fund a statue of Voltaire. Although the statue was completed, it was never put up in a public space in Paris. And today it's in the Louvre Museum 
The statue was to show the writer as he really appeared rather than in an idealized fashion. The statue was a life-size rendition of an older man as Voltaire was at the time. It was a man whose body had been ravaged by time. Now, for those in the 18th century, this lifelike depiction of a naked old man or a nearly naked old man caused a scandal, which is one of the reasons why it was never put up anywhere. But we can see in the contrast between the body of the philosophe and the radiant expression on his face, the message that Pigal meant to send. The beauty of Voltaire's thought transcends the aging of his body. Philosophical endeavors, the statue seemed to say, would leave a longer legacy than mere military conquest. From the 1614 statue of Henry IV to that of Voltaire in 1770, we see a tremendous shift in the ways in which contemporaries thought about public art, but also about what qualified as greatness. In the 17th century, only monarchs deserved to be immortalized and they were depicted as strong conquering heroes. By the late 18th century, not only did statues of kings portray rulers who were caring and just, but other people who had contributed to the greatness of France through the arts were also thought worthy of being immortalized in stone. This corresponds to the value that Enlightenment thinkers placed on a public sphere of reason debate where all educated people could meet as equals regardless of whether they were noble or commoner. It also reflects the beliefs of the philosophes that the production of knowledge and of works of arts was just as, or maybe even more important than the traditional virtues of the warrior the salon where intellectuals met and debated, and Diderot and d'Alembert's massive project of the encyclopedia were born of the same values that shaped these statues of peaceful kings and great men in the second half of the 18th century. If we see the reformist aspects of the enlightenment in these statues, we can also see hints of the revolution to come. One critic of the statue of Louis XV uh, wrote that the inscriptions on the side of the pedestal celebrating the king's accomplishments should have been done in French rather than Latin so that ordinary people could read them. The critic wanted to see a statue of a king that was more accessible to the ordinary Parisian. Others said that the statue celebrated a false victory. The settlement of the Seven Years' War concluded the same year as the statue was inaugurated was disastrous for France, entailing significant territorial losses in North America. During the war itself, heavy taxes had been imposed on the population and these taxes were not lifted with the peace. By 1763, the time that the statue was finished and celebrated, Louis XV had become an unpopular king and his statue was the subject of jokes and insults until his death in 1774. When the young king Louis XVI uh, took the throne in 1774, Parisians celebrated what they hoped would be a new beginning and a better monarch. To mark his advent to the throne, several projects were proposed to build a new square in Paris with his statue at the center. These projects emphasize the king's relationship with the people. In one, the artist imagined Parisians coming up to a statue of a seated king, sharing tears of love as his, at his feet as a child might embrace its parent. Following the attack on the Bastille prison in July of 1789, and the king's subsequent recognition of the National Assembly as a legitimate governing body, these projects focused on the ruined fortress of the Bastille. In one, which we see here, the sta a statue of the king standing in front of the ruins of the Bastille with arms outstretched towards his subjects was meant to commemorate not only the king as father of his people, but also as one who had bestowed liberty upon them. In this imagined project, carved depictions of kingly virtues were absent and instead we see real people thanking their king. None of these projects were ever completed. And as the revolution radicalized, the king fell out of favor. 
he was increasingly considered an opponent to liberty, a man who undermined the efforts of revolutionary leaders to establish a constitutional monarchy. In June of 1790, the royal family tried to escape Paris, where they had been forced to live since October of 1789. They left the city at night in disguise, but were recognized at the small town of Varennes, not, for, not far from the border with Austria. They were arrested and escorted back to Paris. The attempted escape angered Parisians who called for the king to be deposed. Popular prints of the king's return to the capital depicted him as a pig who had wandered out of his pen. For the next two years, the king's attempt to flee Paris and betray the revolution caused dangerous divisions among members of the National Assembly and the population at large. Although he was still housed in the royal palace of the Tuileries, the king had become a virtual prisoner. Royalists were outraged that the king was being treated so badly and was no longer free to come and go as he pleased. Moderates wanted to consolidate the constitutional monarchy that had been established in 1789, but they were worried whether the king would cooperate. On the left, political clubs and society such as that of the Jacobins were calling for Louis XVI to give up the throne. They wanted to see the establishment of a republic. On August 10th, 1792, matters came to a head when a well-organized attack on the Tuileries Palace led by radical sans-culottes caused the royal family to flee for protection to the nearby building where the National Assembly was meeting. They were soon afterwards transferred to the temple prison where the king would remain until he was executed in January 7, 1793 for having acted as a traitor to the Republic. After the August 1792 attack on the Tuileries, revolutionaries toppled the royal statues in Paris. Already in 1790, the National Assembly had ordered that the slaves on the pedestals of the statues of Henry IV and Louis XIV be removed. The, the assembly called them symbols of servitude and said they were reminders that the French people had once been subject without liberty to their kings. Now, as citizens who no longer wish to have a king on the throne, it seemed urgent to erase all reminders of the monarchy from the city. Beginning the day after the attack on the Tuileries Palace on August 11th, shopkeepers took down signs with royal emblems on their names, with royal emblems or names. The initials of kings were often carved into public buildings. These were all erased. And most dramatically, the statues of Henry IV, Louis XIII, Louis XIV, and Louis XV were taken down by crowds who managed to unseat the bronze structures from their stone pedestals. The municipal government of Paris ordered that a pyramid be built upon the ruins of the statue of Louis XIV in the Place des Victoires, upon which the names of those who lost their lives in the attack on the Tuileries Palace would be engraved. So here we see a statue of the great king, Louis XIV, being replaced to commemorate ordinary people who undid the monarchy. In the place or square Louis XV, which was now renamed the square of the revolution, the empty pedestal where the statue of Louis XV had once stood was a monument in its own right. This testament to the power of the people to take down their kings stood very close to the guillotine where enemies of the revolution were executed. After being tried for treason, Louis XVI went to the guillotine on January 21st, 1793. In print such as this one of the king's ex execution, the empty pedestal where the statue of Louis XV once stood was a powerful symbol of the people's power. In, in this print, the pedestal of the former statue looms over the composition. The former Louis XVI, who was tried and executed as the ordinary citizen, Louis Capet, is dwarfed by the pedestal where a statue of his grandfather, Louis XV, once stood. With both man and monarchy gone, the French had established a republic. But what statues would be suitable for a republic? 
Revolutionary leaders believe that public art formed citizens. In other words, they believe that citizens learned their values from the art and monuments around them. In order to form citizens who could rule themselves as members of a republic, it was crucial, revolutionaries believed, to give them models that could teach them what it meant to be free. Gregoire, who was a deputy at the National Assembly, argued that new statues were necessary because when a citizen was surrounded by signs and symbols of the Republic, he absorbed their lessons. In this way, he would acquire what Gregoire called a national character and the demeanor of a free man. Revolutionary leaders put a great deal of energy into creating new statues, or at least a great deal of energy into projects for new statues, which never became permanent. In 1792, the same year that the statue of Louis XV was taken down, the Royal Square where it stood was renamed the Square of the Revolution. Decorative elements reminiscent of the monarchy were removed from the facades of the buildings on the north side, and a plaster Statue of Liberty was erected on the pedestal that formerly held the Statue of the King. This Statue of Liberty was seated, calm, and she gazed out at the guillotine as if she were making the judgments about who should live and who should die. In November of 1793, authorities announced a project for a new statue that was going to be placed in the location where that of Henry IV had once stood. This statue was meant to be colossal and it was to represent the people's victory over tyranny and superstition. In other words, the people's victory over the monarchy and the Catholic church. The values of the new revolutionary citizen were to be literally written on the body of the statue, enlightenment on his forehead, truth over his heart, nature on his torso, force on one worm, on one, excuse me, force on one arm and work on the other. The government called for a competition to design this statue and the image of Hercules quickly emerged as the best suited to represent the power of the people. As with the empty pedestal in the print documenting the execution of Louis XVI, Hercules was supposed to symbolize the power of the French people to remake their world according to the new values of liberty, equality, and fraternity. And if we think about Gregoire's comment that symbol shaped demeanor or how one acted, we might imagine the different reactions that observers might have to a statue of a king and a statue of Hercules. The relationship of a subject to a king was one of deference. As we talked about at the beginning of the lesson, in the decades before the revolution began, kings were seen as fathers who loved and protected their people. Like fathers, they were considered to be wiser and more powerful than their children. The relationship between the king and the subject was one of inequality, and the children owed deference or respect to their more powerful king or father. Now, Hercules was, of course, a very powerful figure, but the citizen who observed the statue of Hercules was meant to identify with it. Hercules did not represent a powerful figure that was different from the citizen. He represented the citizen himself. When a citizen looked at a statue of Hercules, he was supposed to see a reflection of his own power. Furthermore, as the historian Lynn Hunt has argued, Hercules had been used in past centuries as a symbol of monarchical authority. Now, few of those in Paris in 1793 who would view the statue of Hercules would have the education to understand this older reference. But for those who did, they would see the statue as a reminder that the mighty power that was once possessed by kings had been transferred to the people. Like so many revolutionary projects, these projects for statues were never completed. The statue of Hercules was never cast in bronze. The plaster statue of Liberty was never remade in stone. Persistent economic problems, which were exacerbated by war and inflation, made such projects almost impossible to pay for. And changes in political fortunes resulted in changes in what was considered appropriate for public art. 
1793, the Jacobins, who also went by the name of the mountain, constructed an artific artificial mountain on the location of the 1790 Festival of the Federation. This mountain was demolished in 1794 after the Jacobins fell from power. The Statue of Liberty in the Square of the Revolution met the same fate a few years later. In 1806, Napoleon had it demolished and renamed the space the Square of Concord. Napoleon was much more interested in removing reminders of, recent, of the recent revolutionary past from the cityscape than he was in immortalizing new heroes. However, and this is not surprising for Napoleon, he did wish to celebrate the military victories, both of the revolution and of his own armies. In 1806, the same year that he took down the Statue of Liberty in the Place de la Concorde or the Square of Concord, he began work on a triumphal arch in the Champs-Élysées. On its side is the famous sculpture La Marseillaise by Francois Roudet. La Marseillaise, of course, was the hymn that celebrated uh, French soldiers going to war during the revolution. It's the national anthem of France still today. And the, the sculpture on the side of this triumphal arch was meant to commemorate the volunteers who defeated Austrian and Prussian forces at the Battle of Valmy in 1792. This sculpture echoes earlier revolutionary statues in interesting ways, and it also transforms their meanings. So as we can see here, a figure of liberty dominates the group. However, she is not sitting sedately dispensing severe justice as she was portrayed opposite the guillotine. Instead, she leads the way into battle, sword in hand and a fierce battle cry coming from her mouth. Beneath liberty stand a group of soldiers who are all of relatively equal size, except for the central figure whose height strong arms and legs and Roman dress bring to mind the revolutionary project of creating a statue of Hercules. In this sculpture, we see Napoleon's genius for mixing different elements of the past together to create a compromise. The astounding victory of the French armies at Valmy would be remembered and admired by all, save perhaps the most steadfast royalists. And while military images suggest unity of purpose, they also contain within them elements of hierarchy that departed from the revolution's focus on equality. So we see this, for example, in the contrast between the older soldier and the young man who looks up to and is being led by him. Hierarchy returned during the empire and existed in an uneasy relationship with equality. The artist here recognizes this shift while at the same time, by incorporating the figures of liberty and what could be read as Hercules into the sculpture, Roudet didn't turn his back completely on the earlier ideals of the revolution. So he mixes elements of old and new in ways that are meant to bring people together rather than divide people. In the same way, Napoleon established a hereditary dynasty and a new nobility while at the same time staying steadfast to the principles of equality before the law and careers open to talent. Now, perhaps because the square where Louis XVI had been guillotined was too politically sensitive, Napoleon did not attempt to restore the statue of Louis XV that had once stood there, nor did he replace it with something new. This square remained empty throughout the empire. Even after 1815, when the Bur Bourbon monarchy was restored and Louis XVIII took the throne, this location was a difficult one. The restoration government emphasized the need for French men and French women to atone for the sin of killing their king. The historian Emmanuel Furex has described the many measures that were taken by the government to create a culture of mourning for the dead king, including an annual funeral mass in his honor. On this day, all shops, theaters, and restaurants were to be closed, the streets were empty, and every church and synagogue in the city welcomed the bereaved. By the mid-1820s, however, interest in mourning the former king was waning. 
Perhaps to remedy this, when Charles X took the throne in 1824, following the death of Louis XVIII, he announced his intention to erect a statue of Louis XVI in what would now be called the square Louis XVI. Several projects were proposed for the space. Many of them were funerary monuments. For example, a black tombstone. Uh, another project was for a funeral pyre that was to be sculpted in marble. However, to turn this space into one dedicated to mourning Louis XVI was to invite political protest. If, we, if you remember at the beginning of this talk, I mentioned that jokes were made about the statue of Louis XV before the revolution um, when he became an unpopular king. The statue became an object of derision and was subject to graffiti. People wrote little jokes and put them up near the statue. It was a continual problem for the police. Similarly, to create a monument of Louis XVI in such a publicly visible and such a sensitive location where so many people had lost their lives during the revolution would be to invite criticism and possibly protest. The decision to commemorate Louis XVI as a martyr of the revolution was a political decision and one that carried with it a condemnation of the revolution and its principles. However, there were many in France who wished to see greater liberties and greater equalities and who saw the revolution as a good thing, a funeral monument to the former king in the heart of Paris risked becoming a target of graffiti or worse, a target of destruction. Instead, the government built a chapel at a nearby cemetery where the king and queen had been buried after their execution. This location is in the current eighth arrondissement of Paris. Today, it's very out of the way and hidden by trees. You really have to know that it's there to see it. It is clearly a sacred space, one dedicated not only to the memory of the royal family, but also to the 3000 souls who were buried there during the revolution. The statue of the king that exists there, the statue of Louis XVI is not overtly political it shows an angel taking him to heaven. It's placed inside a very small, very quiet chapel hidden from the views of passers-by. The decision to create a monument to Louis XVI in a quiet corner of the city where it would be unlikely to attract the anger of those who wanted liberal, liberal reforms was politically sound, but it couldn't save the Bourbon monarchy. After another revolution in July, 1830, Charles X was replaced by another member of the Capetian family, a younger branch than the Bourbon family, uh, Louis Philippe. So Louis Philippe styled himself the citizen king. He wished to move France beyond the divisions of the revolutionary period. And one of the ways in which he did this was through public art. So while the Restoration monarchs, Louis XVIII and Charles X, had been unable to find a suitable solution for the location where Louis XVI had been killed, Louis Philippe succeeded. He once again renamed this square, once again, as under Napoleon, the Square of Concord. But he placed there no statues of kings or any other leader. Instead, he placed there an ancient Egyptian obelisk the obelisk of Luxor. This was placed in the center of the square in 1836. The obelisk was a gift from the Egyptian ru ruler, Muhammad Ali Pasha. The journey of the obelisk from Egypt to Paris was remarkable, covered in all of the newspapers, and the erection of the obelisk itself was hailed as a feat of engineering. This obelisk was a remarkable choice for this location. In ancient Egypt, the obelisk was a funerary monument that symbolized the dawning of a new day after the night. It also symbolized the immortality of the ruler that it was meant to commemorate, and they were often placed next to statues of Egyptian rulers. The themes of renewal, the movement from night to day, and of persistence, the immortality of the ruler or the state, these themes were extremely meaningful in a France that had endured political instability and several regime changes. 
They suggested a continuation of the French state as well as, as its ability to be reborn out of the darkness. In addition, the obelisk of Luxor invoked Napoleon's invasion of Egypt in 1798. Although Napoleon failed to conquer Egypt, the French scientists who accompanied him made important discoveries, including the Rosetta Stone, which provided the key needed to decipher Egyptian hieroglyphics. Furthermore, Muhammad Ali Pasha, who gave the obelisk to Louis Philippe, had continued the modernizing efforts that were begun by Napoleon. The obelisk was a testament to France's legacy and influence in the region. In addition, the expedition to Egypt, even though it failed, increased interest in North Africa. In 1830, one of the last acts of Charles X was to invade Algeria, which became France's first colony of the modern age. Situated in the Place de la Concorde, the square of Concord or Harmony, in the same location where the statue of Louis XV had once stood and where the guillotine had taken the life of Louis XVI, the obelisk of Luxor was a fitting monument to the modern age. It evoked the complexity of French history, acknowledging both the darkness and the light that had characterized the 18th century. It had once stood next to statues of the great Egyptian king Ramses II, it now stood where the monarchy had faced its darkest days. It was a visible reminder of Napoleon's exploits and of France's forays into North Africa. When the obelisk was raised before cheering crowds, the age of revolution came to an end and the age of imperialism had begun. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this talk. <laughs>